Good evening. Uh, a warm welcome on behalf of Uitgeverij de Bezige Bij, SPUI 25 en Atheneum Bookstore, to this event celebrating the publication of Michael Pye's new book, Antwerp the Glory Years, or in Dutch translation, Ant Antwerpen de Gloria. My name is Francine Schuursma, and I'm the publisher of De Bezige Bij, or The Busy Bee in English. Uh, the book has been out in English for over a month now, and the Dutch translation came out two weeks ago. And the book is getting rave reviews on both sides of the pond. Reviewers are praising the knowledge and insights the book shares with its readers. But even more importantly, they praise the author and his writing skills. Pai writes beautifully, has a lovely eye for detail and an obvious affection for this period of Antwerp's history, so the observer says. Pai's prose is as opulent as the city itself, says the Times. One reviewer compared the book to the novels of Hilary Mantel, and yet another to the narrative quality of Italo Calvino. And in these quarters, both Geert Mark and Jeroen Olieslagers loved the book so much, they even praised it before it came out. In Geert Max's words, feel, smell, taste, listen. Michael Pye has written an overwhelming portrait of the city of Antwerp in its glory years. And Jeroen Olieslager says, this book is a gift, perfectly aimed at anyone who wants to know more about Antwerp's golden years, period. What you didn't get know yet, you will learn here. And what you thought you knew will be deepened by this well-read born storyteller. In 2015, the Busy Bee, the Bezige Bij, published Michael Pye's History of the North Sea, The Edge of the World, or in Dutch, Aan de Rand van de Wereld. The book was selected as Book of the Month by the then very influential TV show The Wereld Draait Door. That program no longer exists, but with all the early praise it's getting, I am convinced that Antwerpen will, by its own strength, find at least as many readers here in the Netherlands and in Flanders. I can go on, but I think this is the time you all want to listen to the author himself. He will, be, he will be interviewed here on stage by Diederik Burgersdijk, who teaches Latin and classical history at the University College Utrecht and at the Cartesius Lyceum here in Amsterdam. He's also the author of several books on classical history. After their conversation, you, the audience, will have the opportunity to ask questions. The program will finish at around 9, 9.15, 9.30, we will see. And then I'm sure you will all run to Atheneum's table in the back to buy your own copy of Antwerpen and have it signed by the author. I wish you all a wonderful evening. Thank you. Welcome to this event of SPUI 25 on this uh, lovely late summer evening. Back again with a live audience and welcome to those watching online, outside, out there, at home and welcome uh, to everyone. The evening is um, entirely devoted to the publication of Michael Pye's Antwerp, as Francine already pointed out, thank you. And also welcome to the Busy Gebij, the Busy Bee. Tonight we are going to discuss the book and its subject, Antwerp. But before doing so, I would like to begin with an introduction to Michael Pye's works and how it came all about, up to but not including Antwerp, because Michael Pye will be here to tell us about the city. My name is Diederik Burgersdijk, moderator at SPI 25, and I, I will guide you uh, through the evening, which will be continued with an interview, and there will be room for you also in the audience uh, to ask questions to the author. I'd like to give a small overview, brief overview of uh, Michael Pye's work. Are these all authored by you, Michael? Yeah, no, not by someone else called Michael Pye? Yeah. Yeah. It's not the Japanese, but it's the one, and it's not the one who writes books that you were familiar 
I left them deliberately out, yeah. But uh, Michael also wrote about Japanese Buddhist uh, themes. Yeah. Um, but uh, these are the books uh, from the around uh, 80, from the 70s and the 80s, beginning with the movie Brett's about the Scorsese family and what they meant uh, to Hollywood. And uh, from 1981 dates The King Over the Water, uh, about the behavior of the Duke of Windsor at the Bahamas. Very intriguing and fascinating figure. Um, and also a very, uh, well, uh, the, the subtitle is The Scandalous Truth uh, About the Winters, uh, Winters War Years, a typically Michael Pye character. Um, then there is a biography of a city, this time the Maximum City, the biography of New York. Three books have been translated later to Dutch, and the first one of them is The Drowning Room, about uh, the winter in New York of 1642, with the Dutch character Grietje Reiniers, a war a prostitute who had to stay alive there. It is translated into Dutch as The Waterkelder in 1995. Another book is... Um, Taking Lives, about another Dutch character, uh, Martin uh, Arkenhout, who stole the lives of people by killing them and taking their identities, and is translated as Gestolen Levens in 1999. The third one of the translated books is uh, The Pieces from Berlin, about the art dealer Lucia Müller-Rossi, who uh, stole art from killed uh, Jewish people, uh, they were murdered in the war, and she uh, sold their uh, belongings and their property, their art, and it had a, uh, well, uh, it is about how it inflicted also on their, on her offspring, her children and grandchildren. Um, well, and the book by which uh, Michael really became an international best-selling author is uh, The Edge of the world, about the North Sea and what impact it had on the formation of Europe and uh, eventually the whole world. Uh, it's a view that is often applied to the Mediterranean Sea, I think, but not so far on the North Sea, but uh, it can as well be applied to the North Sea and how it connected people's um, languages, cultures and commodities, merchants. Um, it's very worthwhile to read and also it got a lot of uh, public acclaim. That brings us to uh, the book that is the focus of tonight, uh, Antwerp, the Glory Years, Antwerpen, the Glory Jaren. Um, I, I'm not going to talk about the book, but because Michael will do it himself and I will ask questions about it, but I want to, uh, to point out the background. I took a painting by Van Valkenburg of uh, a landscape with Antwerp in the background on a late September evening. I thought it very applicable for tonight, but it's my pleasure and honor uh, to invite Michael uh, Pai to the floor and he will give a further insertion. Michael. Thank you, Diedrich. I have to say it is wonderful to have good reviews, and I'm not going to lie and say that I am indifferent to them. I have only one problem now, which is that I've been compared to Hilary Mantel, Robert Hughes, who's dead, Simon Sharma, who isn't, uh, various other people. And I, I feel that I have a future now as a sort of non-binary zombie, half-dead. This is the only way in which I can go forward in old age. People ask why on earth you wrote a book about Antwerp, or at least they do much more in the United Kingdom than they do here. And the reason is really quite simple. As a boy, way back in the Jurassic Age, I had this vision of going out to find lost cities. And I sort of assumed that this would involve hacking my way through the jungle, taking a dugout boat up the Marrowine, whatever you like. It never occurred to me that you could do the same thing by taking Thales to Antwerp. But in a curious sort of way, you can. Because although Antwerp continues, there is a great port in the same geographical area as it always was. Antwerp, the great Antwerp, the Antwerp that people seriously talked about as the center and hub of the world that Europe knew, is gone. So I'm fascinated by two things. One is to try to get back to that city, that lost city. One is, of course, to try to explain why it was lost, 
Was it lost or was it hidden? Was it put away? And I wanted to do something else. There's an enormous amount of yeah, more or less Marxist, um, so I was going to say theology, but uh, ideology, let's say, um, about this period of European history, about the early 16th century. It's the moment when the, the mechanisms, the machinery of feudal power and rural power begin to fall apart when power moves into cities, moves into towns, and when, uh, in Lefebvre's words, money rules the world. What's really interesting is to take that as an idea and to try to work out what it was to live that change. If you think about it, we're probably, at this moment, living some kind of historical or social change because I think we have a sense, probably quite a general sense, that the world can't simply go on as it is now. We're also, as it happens, living through a plague, which is something which the Antwerp of the 16th century knew a great deal about. Not masks, but white sashes, if you were exposed to plague. Um, these are things which need to be brought alive. If you leave them at the level of theory and abstraction, they make no sense to people, I think, at all. But it's possible, I think, to find a way to bring them back to life, to show what it must have been to go through all of this extraordinary period. Now, as you may or may not know, you can't very easily do that from the archives in Antwerp um, for many reasons, but not least because, I mean, 16th century papers do get lost, but unfortunately the Spanish soldiers who rampaged through Antwerp burning and killing also managed to set fire to the town hall and the records in it. So there are gaps. So how do you begin to tell this story? Well, in a way, it's like, the, remember those old-fashioned 19th century stereoscopic viewers where you saw things from two angles, and because you were seeing them from two angles, they developed a certain solidity they were almost real. You have to find, I had to find, the sources in many other archives across Europe to tell this story. I wanted to go back to the, the divines and the ministers of Zurich. I wanted to go back to the, the Medici archives because the Medici had a great... They liked horses from Antwerp. They liked pictures from Antwerp. But more than anything, Cosimo Medici liked gossip from Antwerp. It was the most important thing that people brought him which is wonderful if you're trying to make something to life. It's also true that there is in Lisbon material, there's in Seville material, all over the place, because everybody was focused on Antwerp. That is the surprising thing. The moment you begin to make a claim like this is the, the hub of the known world, people quite reasonably sort of <coughs> cough slightly and try to say, what on earth do you mean? Well, it was, and people said that of it and people watched it very carefully. They had to watch what was bought and sold, because it could be clues to where the next war was going to happen. Who's buying armour? Who's buying money to pay soldiers, and where are they going to pay them? What kind of coins do they want? The buying and selling of information was one of Antwerp's basic trades, because it was the focus, because it was the hub, because it was the point of exchange. And that, to me, is what is essentially thrilling about Antwerp at this period. It's, you can find many places where people's sense of inquisitiveness about the world, the curiosity, wanting to know, is present. But very few where they got so many answers, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you for your introduction. Have you been to Antwerp a lot for research? For oh, your... yes. <laughs> yes, you live, yeah. yes. You live in Amsterdam, don't you? Yes, I do. Yes. yes. They do have a lot in common, Amsterdam and Antwerp. Yes, I know, but I've learned never to say anything in public about that. <laughs> about your uh, idea of Amsterdam. Well, no, well, after all, I mean, Amsterdam, in a way, is, is the successor city to Antwerp, isn't it? I mean, it's the, the plan of the Grachten modelled. Yes. on the canals of the, the north of Antwerp, the printing industries and the other industries that moved with the, the, the move of Protestants when the Spanish took over again. 
so Amsterdam is the successor city to Antwerp. Uh, yes, uh, the, there's an awful quote in, in, in the context of the printing trade, which is that uh, Amsterdam was feeding on the corpse of Antwerp, yes. which is a revolting <laughs> idea, but never mind. <laughs> yes, and how did it come all about? It's because of the wars uh, fought in Antwerp, and uh, Amsterdam stayed a free city. Yes, but also, also because Antwerp was a central problem and a central institution yes. for the Habsburg Empire. I yes. mean, remember, after the 1540s, every bill of exchange, the bits of paper that depended on other people's credit, which did what money does now, had to be encashed and checked in the bourse at Antwerp, nowhere else in the Spanish Netherlands. Yeah, but I think Antwerp was also a relatively independent city from the Habsburgs, that those were the glory years that they could... Yes, well, the, Habs the Habsburgs didn't think so. Yeah. Uh, the Habsburgs were rather cross about it, but Antwerp certainly, there are wonderful stories. I mean, at one point um, from Mechelen and Brussels come investigators who are supposed to check where all the pestilential new Christians, in other words, Jews, are living in Antwerp. And they arrive, and, and Mr. Boisseau arrives to, to ask questions, and is greeted by, by the people of the city who say, well, it's, it's about five o'clock in the evening. It seems a little late to get started on this now. Perhaps we'd better do it in the morning. So the imperial ambassador says, well, I would very much like to talk to the Margrave. And they say, well, he's a little indisposed, but he could perhaps see you in the morning. The morning comes, and six o'clock comes, seven o'clock comes, and various people say, well, you can't go out and do it now. I mean, you'll just disturb people. Yeah. It's dark, you know, you, you, you can't rush around asking questions now. And they, did, they managed this for something like 18 hours, until finally everybody that the empire was looking for had managed to go away, unsurprisingly. Okay. <laughs> um, and what, what do you define the, the glory years uh, of Antwerp? That, that's the 1500s to, to the fall of Antwerp in 85? Yes, a slightly, yes. I, I've got a slightly different view. I tried to avoid saying golden age because yes. I hate the phrase. Although in... Uh, America, it is called the uh, Golden Years of Antwerp. Yes, yes, yes. Don't blame me for everything that's on the cover of my books. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's one, one of those things. Um, no, to my mind, it begins when the Portuguese spice ships mm. first begin to anchor in Antwerp and not in Bruges. In other words, when this enormously lucrative trade, yes. this world trade, begins to have a headquarters in Antwerp. This is... Begins to have a headquarters in Antwerp, and that's certainly where it begins. Where it ends, I have a slightly different view. I think it ends with the Bildungsturm. I think it ends with the iconoclasm, because that's the point at which this very delicate, very messy compromise that nobody was talking about as a compromise, but which managed to keep the wars of the Reformation out of Antwerp to a surprising extent. Yeah, and that was fifth That compromise goes, that's the end. Yes, exactly. Yeah, there were yeah. Uh, three uh, troublesome years, uh, 66, 74, when uh, Antwerp exactly. was changed. And then, and then, then the Duke of Alba comes tromping yeah. in, um, behaves appallingly, and by the way, made more money out of the Antwerp money markets while he was apparently suppressing heresy yeah. than any other activity. Mm. He, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We are already talking about the uh, fall of Antwerp, but we have to talk about uh, glory years, and also about uh, the foreigners, the predecessors of Antwerp, and I think, uh, well, you mentioned uh, Portugal, Lisbon, but also Venice. Uh, the Venetians must have been baffled by the success of Antwerp as a merchant city. And I understood from your book there were even spies yes, and merchants. Or well, the Venetian ambassadors are a wonderful source for this kind of book yes. because they really reported everything because they were mystified by it. Yeah. I mean, how could they not be flashy? How did they manage to drink so much? And was that possibly why the women ran businesses? Because the men were all drunk. But the Venetian ambassador said, no, actually, the women drink just as much, so it can't be that. <laughs> and that they were observing all the time, all the time. But Venice, of course, had every reason to panic. Yes. The Levantine yeah. trade and the Red Sea trade were, as it were, out of date yeah. because the oceanic trade routes coming round Africa yeah. from India were, 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 were opening up spectacularly. Yeah. And the Atlantic Ocean opened up, which was uh, uh, good for Antwerp. Of course. Yeah. 
No, absolutely, absolutely. I and mean, that's one of the points about the glory years. Antwerp really was not just the hub of the world that Europe knew, mm -hmm. but the hub of how the world that Europe knew worked, of all of these trading routes and all of the places where things had to be exchanged. You know? yeah. Sometimes it's a, it's a baleful story. Um, you've got metals coming in from Germany which turn into objects you can buy in Antwerp in exchange for slaves when you go down to Africa. Yes. And sometimes it's a rather more optimistic story, but it's, a, it's always the centre of trade. There was also trade in people, as you mentioned, the yeah. slave trade, yes. And also uh, many African people uh, around in Antwerp. That's actually one of, one of the great, in a way, one of the great mysteries. Um, various people who knew both Lisbon and Antwerp say that the only other city with as many Africans was, was Lisbon. But, of course, in Lisbon, Africans were very visible because, for some reason, Africans ran the ferry trade across the river of Tagus and the various other ferry trades in Portugal. Yes. Uh, so, you know, I mean, obviously, you noticed that there were a lot of Africans about. Um, more than any city in uh, Europe elsewhere, more apart than, from Lisbon. Lisbon and Antwerp were the two, yes. 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 And it's because of connections, yeah. connections with the world out there, not just about people being brought in slavery because actually Antwerp had rather generous laws about people being able to ask for freedom immediately they landed. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but no, the, 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 it's part of this, I think, glorious mixture. You have every kind of heresy, every kind of skin colour, every kind of language. I mean, the language is spoken on the streets but it was said that women who were brought up in Antwerp and hadn't ever left Antwerp still spoke six or seven languages, yeah. because you had to. And those glory years are also the Calvinist years of Antwerp, which uh, vouched for a very liberal approach, yeah, from the liberal government. Uh, everything was possible, mm, much yes. more than under Catholicism. Or I'm not sure there. that's entirely true, actually, if you don't mind me being difficult about I it. I'm just <laughs> that, I, um, it's true that the true that, 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 that Catholic oppression, if you want to call it that, uh, was also imperial oppression. It was very political. Yes. The emperor's idea was that heresy was less majesty. Yeah. It, was a t it was an attack on authority. And if you attack the church's authority, you were also attacking the emperor's authority. But the Calvinists were really quite disagreeable in their own way. I mean, there, there, there were sort of yeah. people who sort of turned up and, and, and went to talk to congregations of nuns and just shout dirty words at them. Yeah. Very mature way to attempt conversion. Mm. Yeah, but, but the freedom and the glory years of uh, Antwerp were over when the Catholics came in. When and the Calvinists after that, of course. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You don't do a lot of politics in the book... Uh, Am I mistaken there? Um, Antwerp didn't have a real government. Uh, it was dependent or part of the Habsburg Empire, but they weren't really governed by a, a community board or the... Well, there were, I mean, there were all the structures in place. There, there, yeah. were, there was the Great Council, there are other councils and all the rest of it. But they actually couldn't do very much. Yeah. It's quite extraordinary. I mean, Antwerp is a very rare example, I can't think of another one, of a major city in Europe that was reshaped, restructured, repurposed by one man. I mean, not by any city council. You know. Yeah, but by one man. And who's that? Schoenbeker? Or... Well, Schoenbeker, yeah. of course. <laughs> yeah, he was Dutch, wasn't he? Yes, you might not want to claim him. He is, he, is a man, he is a man of whom it was said that he didn't even have a single hair on his body mm. that he had not acquired by theft. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, sort of... And there were all those um, uh, Portuguese and Italian merchants who were very powerful and almost governed the city just by their trade. Yes, governed the city is an odd thing to say. They, they managed not to be interfered with by the city. Yes. Um, whereas for the Italians, that was fairly straightforward. For the Portuguese, it wasn't. I mean, the great Portuguese merchants who were running the spice trade, after all, were Novos Christianos. They, they, they were Jews who were masquerading as respectable citizens of the empire, if you like, yes. which they rather had to do in order to save their lives. And also strange things happen as, that, as a consequence. Antwerp becomes the centre of a kind of, to use the American term, underground railway, which was taking Jews who needed to get out of Portugal 
and were forbidden to leave, and forbidden to leave with any assets, yes. to get them out of Portugal, yeah. to get them into Antwerp, where they could wait until the right moment to get out and to get across, probably in the end, to Istanbul. Where they could lead a free life? Or? Relatively, yes. 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 It's where they weren't under threat of execution for heresy. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, there's a lot of merchandise in your book. How, how about uh, intellectual life in Antwerp? <laughs> because there, there were those uh, printing houses, uh, Plantin, uh, for example, were the most famous one, I think. Uh, but were there much scholars? Uh, was there most, much scholarship? There was a huge amount of scholarship. And the really interesting thing is, you know, we, we have this sort of rather, rather snobbish way of separating the scholarly, the academic, the respectable from the commercial and the merchant life. That is something that would have made no sense at all in Antwerp in the 16th century. Um, the various people, Ashen came from, from, from England to visit Antwerp and said he couldn't get on with the grandees in Antwerp and he couldn't get on with anybody like that. But he could get on with the merchants because they were also scholars. And there are various people who complain almost for all of their lives. It's their main occupation, complaining about the fact that business keeps getting in the way of this really good new Latin edition that they're planning. You know? Yes, yeah. And uh, multilingual editions of the Bible, for Absolutely, example. Absolutely, famously, yes. Yes, yes so yes, all yes, the, yes. the English... Um, well, uh, heretics went to Antwerp to print their translations. Well, exactly, because again, Antwerp had this very, very pragmatic attitude. Yes. Yeah. Uh, fine, we will allow you to print your books. As in the case of Tyndale's Bible, uh, there was one print run, the very famous one of 1525, and a year later, the same books that Antwerp had made possible were publicly burned in Antwerp as the politics about heresy changed moment by moment. And reprinted again ten years later. No, reprinted again yeah. immediately. Yes, I mean nothing, nothing <laughs> stopped it. Um, yeah. They were the, the, the Antwerp was told to execute people who published bad books, yeah. but then said, "Well, no. On the whole, execution seemed a bit rough, and perhaps they would banish them." Yeah. And as you know, 16th century banishment was very theoretical. It basically said, "Go out the main gate." stay out there for at least 10 minutes and please don't try to live in the city for at least a month. <laughs> <laughs> That's banishment uh, exactly. on the Belgian yep. way. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, uh, translations of Bibles were forbidden in, in England, so the Stindel went to uh, Plantin or another printer. No, to, it, was, to have it, was, it was before Plantin was there. Um, it, 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 it's a, again, it's, it, it's to do with the the whole tissue of what made Antwerp work, part of what made it possible to, to produce English language Bibles in Antwerp, of course, was that there were printing presses, that they were wonderfully efficient, they could actually get them and get them sent. But the other thing that mattered was the wool trade, surprisingly enough. It was ships going back and forth from Antwerp to England with enormous loads of stuff that nobody really wanted to investigate with all sorts of brand names and codes on them so that you could pick out the particular bundle that you wanted. Thomas More was very good at doing that. He was constantly getting evidence about what was travelling under the wrong label. Yeah. Um, but the combination of the wool trade, the printing presses, the fact that a lot of paper at the time was coming from northern France and it was much easier to take it up the Gelt into Antwerp than it was to take it, let's say, up the Rhine to Worms or any of the other printing centres that were also important. Put all of those together and you have a place where all things become possible. And then what becomes remarkable is what people use it for. And Thomas More was the one who um, had his utopia printed in Antwerp and even... No, Ooh, no that's yeah. the interesting thing. Okay. He didn't have it printed in, in Antwerp, not for, very, for a very long time. Um, but he set it in Antwerp. He set it in Antwerp. He set it in Antwerp as the place where you found out yeah. these strange and wonderful things. Yeah. But no, not printed in Antwerp, which is incidentally a, a quite good backing for my point. Mm -hmm. Had it been printed in Antwerp, you and I might be a lot less surprised that it was a good boosterish book about Antwerp. Yes. No, 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 no. It yeah. was printed elsewhere. Yeah. Um, and... It was also depicted on the famous Bruegel painting of the Tower of Babel, isn't it? Uh, that was also just, uh, set in Antwerp. Well, I think so, yes. I mean, it's, That's it's, what you say in the book. 
Yes, I know. Yes, well, I say, I think so. I really do. <laughs> no, it's all right. I'm still convinced. <laughs> What's fascinating about it is there are two versions, as you know. There's in Vienna and in Rotterdam. Vienna yeah. and Rotterdam, exactly. The Vienna one was painted in Antwerp. And if you look at that Tower of Babel, it's, it's under construction. It's almost like one of Breitel's catalogue paintings, you know, one of children's games, all sorts of children's games. Well, this is a painting about construction and all sorts of methods of construction. There's every kind of crane, every kind of device, every way of building. But it's very much under construction. It's slightly chaotic. There are many, many floors which it's unimaginable that anybody could ever stand on or could ever use but it's enormous energy. And in the foreground, there is Nimrod the tyrant, who may or may not be Charles V, who knows? Um, but the point is that two years later, Bruegel painted the second version. He painted it in Brussels, not Antwerp. He'd been exiled to Brussels, um, part for good commercial reasons, but also because his mother-in-law had said that he was going to get the hell out of Antwerp because Antwerp was where his usual mistress lived and she was not putting up with that. His wife, curiously enough, does not seem to have intervened at this stage, but never mind. Anyway, you, you get the Brussels painting, which is a monument. It's this great sort of wedding cake of masonry. It's solid. It's purposeful. So at least it's a good allegory for Antwerp. Exactly. Even if it is, uh, Nothing like the first one. Yeah, yeah wonderful. Uh, there were quite some very famous painters in Antwerp by the time. Massais was one of them. Yeah. Van Cleve. Yeah. And um, you also have this uh, painting of the money uh, exchanger. In the yes, book. of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, it also found its way in, in art, this merchant. Um, identity of Antwerp. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I remember that art was becoming a merchandise in Antwerp. Yes. It, it wasn't a service. You didn't go to your court painter and say, please paint me and my relations and make us look good. Um, you bought off the peg. Yes. You bought paintings that had already been made. Yeah. And the first dealers start in Antwerp. I'm sorry, Amsterdam, but it is about 100 years before Amsterdam. Uh -huh. um, And indeed, when the Bourse was built, in the course of building it in the 1530s, this wonderful new palace of commerce, at the last minute they decided to add an extra floor. And that extra floor was for art dealers. Oh, yes. It was yeah. buying and selling paintings. Yeah. Wonderful. Yes, and, and it also attracted other painters like Durer, who, want to, who wanted to see Antwerp and buy their stuff there. There's, Well, there were colours that Dürer could only get in Antwerp. Yes, 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 yes. like. Uh, what colours did he like? Oh, well, the lapis lazuli was a lot easier to get in Antwerp than anywhere else. Yeah. And there were bricks of some mysterious red. Well, I can't track down exactly what it was, but there, is a, there are bricks of a mysterious red that, um, again, he could only get in Antwerp. Yeah. Yes. And then he painted this beautiful painting of the African girl, one of the first... It is glorious. Isn't yeah, it? it's uh, beautiful, isn't it? It's now uh, at, in the exhibition at, at uh, Aachen. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the Dürer exhibition. It's a wonderful painting. It's quite magnificent. It, it, yeah. it, she, it, she would only see her in Antwerp. Yeah, she was. She was a servant of Catherine. the Portuguese factor. Yes. Um, and I think the face is quite extraordinary. It does. I think, in some ways, it's it's the strongest painting of a slave or of slavery that I know. It's not brutal, it's the resignation. Yeah. It's the fact that she knows she cannot make another choice. Yeah, very individual portrait, yeah. and, uh, really as a human being. Absolutely, and uh, absolutely, yes, yes, yes. Wonderful. It's like spectacular. Um, yes, and uh, after 85, there were a lot of refugees also to, to the Netherlands, and they took all the knowledge and uh, skills to the Netherlands. One of them is... Uh, The family of Vondel, our famous author. He's not in the book, uh, Vondel. But he... no, 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 not enough Antwerp. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But his, his family came from uh, Antwerp. Yes, yes, yes. The, the Vondel. Vondel, Joost van den Vondel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. van den Vondel. Yeah. Um, yes, well, um, maybe there are questions from the floor oh, sure. also. Sure, because um, I have a lot of que more questions to pose. Yes. That's what he does, said. Does this also apply for Harlem? Because I, I heard <laughs> at some point uh, about half of the population of Harlem 
existed or Flemish people? Well, there was a huge migration. I mean, first of all, it begins a long time before the Spanish take back Antwerp in 75. Sorry, 85, I'm slipping decades. Um, people were leaving Antwerp because they couldn't do business there anymore. Painters were saying, you know, no, no, I'm going because I need to be somewhere I can sell my paintings. But then, of course, by the, when the Spanish do take over again, there is a deliberate policy of allowing Protestants to leave. And it's a quite exceptional policy for, this, for the empire, actually, because they were allowed to leave with their property. So they could not just go physically. They could take what they owned. So they could move the business, the capital, everything else. So, yes, I mean, one third of the population of Antwerp vanished in two years. How many people are there? One third? Sorry, how many, how many people are there? Uh, one third. One third, about 33,000. 33,000. It's a population that fluctuates, but it's around 100,000. And so. Um, Oh, yes, 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 always. And always, always changing. I and mean, people were always coming in, wave after wave of immigration, um, which was needed because actually there, were, there was such a high death rate from plague that without immigration, Antwerp would actually have shrunk. Yeah, you have also a very interesting book about the plague in Antwerp and all the measures that were taken to... Uh to stop it. Yes, yes, they sound horribly familiar, don't they? Yes, <laughs> yeah, it was fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. all the quarantine measures and laws that were issued. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's the other thing about Antwerp laws, of course. There's hardly an Antwerp law that wasn't passed at least eight times in the course of the 16th century, which might tell you how good Antwerpers were at obeying any of these laws. <laughs> they usually didn't bother, so they simply passed the law again and hoped it would work. Yes, I looked at them, but I, I, <clears throat> there's something rather odd about this. If you're a foreigner writing a book about a city like Antwerp, in a way you need foreigners' points of view, because foreigners are not going to take anything much for granted. So the descriptions, which can be as vivid as you like from local people, don't necessarily help a writer like me trying to explain to readers, hopefully, like you. I mean, yes, there's a huge amount of material, and there's, Lord knows there's enough printed material as well from the occasional po eyewitness poem, which I think is a, not a genre I'd ever come across before, but the eyewitness poem is very useful, <laughs> and, and um, all manner of other things. But you do need, as I say, this stereoscopic view. And in that sense, in the knowledge that you can't correct the local view from the archives. Not because they've all disappeared, they haven't, of course, but because there aren't the kind of sets of archives that would allow you to do the usual civic history things. You know, how did guilds work? Can we tell that story from the books of the guilds? Nope, we can't, haven't got them. Uh, do we know, do we have criminal records which are detailed enough to tell us about the real street life of the city? Nope, gone. We don't have enough to write a history, as it were, to correct the views of local people. I know that sounds as I'm saying that nobody in Antwerp could possibly be honest about Antwerp. That's not the point. The point is nobody in Antwerp could have that distance and that view and that sense of puzzlement and surprise, which one really needs in order to try to bring this to life. Yeah. And you did make a lot of use of diaries and reports from foreigners, visitors yes, who came course. to Antwerp, yeah, 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 but yeah. not the inside view. It's hard to reconstruct this. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. <clears throat> also, I mean, we have some wonderful sources for Antwerp. Yeah. For example, the diaries of Durer, the painter, 
and Guicciardini. The, uh, well, Gu yeah. well, Guicciardini's great book on, on, the, on the Low Countries, of course, yeah. yeah yes, yeah. yeah. But there are all sorts of other sources. I mean, there are even, Lord help us, um, 16th century novels, uh, which, which are actually quite amusing. Um, the Wickram's novels. Uh, with good reason to suppose that Wickram, who never moved more than 10 miles from Colmar in his entire life, yeah. actually did know about Antwerp, which is an interesting fact in itself, because he'd crossed paths with a group of conversos, um, Novus Christianus, who were fleeing from Antwerp and heading towards Italy. And his great friend, whom he thanks at the beginning of the book, was the man who translated for them when they were being interrogated in Colmar. He had something like six weeks of evidence, of information, of testimony about what Antwerp was like. What were the languages spoken? What was the official language, the lingua franca in, in Antwerp? Strange as it sounds, I don't think there was a lingua franca. I know that sounds weird. But constantly, once talk, people talk about the number of languages that people speak in Antwerp. And Antwerp, of course, was, was the centre of the production of language books in Europe. And those language books tend to be translations between six or seven languages. What did you speak on the streets? Well, you'd have spoken what I'm going to call Netherlandish because it's, there's always the problem of knowing whether to, at what point do we say Dutch. But, um, but probably that wouldn't have got you through everything that you needed to do walking down a street in Antwerp. And the authorities? Oh, well, the authorities, of course, had every, all the official languages. They, had, they had, well, also had Latin, of course. Um, and they had French to a certain extent. And they had um, Netherlandish sometimes. But the, I, the idea of a lingua franca doesn't work. I don't think in Antwerp. Yeah, and period. what about schooling? Because there, there were the Latin schools where uh, young children uh, learned Latin. Yes, yes. Young children learned Latin and young girls learned yeah. French. Maybe also as Nothing a preparation changes. for a university. And, and the younger people... Learned... No, 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 nobody went to university. No, nobody. No, no. <laughs> that was a university. No, 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 no. Lincoln, come on, come on, get out of the 21st century. Um, <laughs> I tried to imagine the 16th century, <laughs> but there was a university nearby. But of course uh, there were universities, yeah. and of course there were very distinguished there? ones. But the ordinary process of educating, for example, somebody who was going to go into business, Yes. would be that they went to school up to the age of about 12, 13. But these are boys I'm talking about. Uh, 12, 13. Yeah. After which they went into business and they learnt on the job. Yes. Which again is why I suspect that they learnt many languages very early. And who did go to university? Only uh, people from Louvain? Or? Well, well, no, rather few people actually. I mean, yeah. it, 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 I mean, there are a lot of people, one's quite surprised mm. at the people in Antwerp who had not been to university. But people who were interested in mathematics, for example, yes. and hadn't bothered to go to Ingelberg or Louvain, which is strange. Yeah. But you also uh, focus on the, um, uh, education for young girls. Hmm? The, yeah. There were, yeah. Yes. Uh, there's a whole chapter on uh, female education. Well, it, well, it, well for two, two reasons. Yes. Let's do the dull one first, and then we can do the interesting <laughs> one later. The dull one is that teaching was one of Antwerp's great trades. The percentage of people who actually worked as teachers was extraordinarily high. Yeah. And the industry of teaching was very important economically. That's the dull reason. The second reason is that everybody from outside who's writing about Antwerp, who's writing about Flanders at the time, talks about the women, always. They're either deeply shocking, deeply wonderful, deeply independent, deeply powerful, all of these things. And they really do upset people. You can see it in the reactions of Italians in particular, who were used to the girls of good family being kept away until, with a good dowry, they could be married off at a very early age. No, women in Flanders had a period when they could actually make some choices for themselves before they got married, when they actually had a chance to decide on a job, an occupation, all the rest of it. It's, it's sort of... It's proto-feminism the, with the best possible support system. Or when they were widowed and could take over the merchandise of their... Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean a, wife, a wife could also be a businesswoman in her own right, yes. as long as she wasn't in the same trade as her husband. Mm -hmm. But she could be completely in her own right, I and mean, she could do, yeah. make all the arrangements herself. 
But the women are extraordinary. I mean, there's lovely stuff, unfortunately, from the Inquisition records in Venice. But um, one guy who was talking about going to Antwerp and meeting the girls, and it was wonderful because you could sit by them. And even though you didn't have a language in common, you could still somehow communicate, and you could kiss, and you could hold them, and they knocked your hat into the river just like anybody else would. <laughs> so it, it was really the Tower of Babel uh, and oh, with all the languages. Yes, yes. Yeah. And w what language did they learn in school? So French uh, for the business people, the young... Uh, they, would, they would, in their business languages, yes. there were at least six. Yeah. They would have needed Italian, they would have needed Spanish. They wouldn't have needed Portuguese quite so much, oddly enough, even though the Portuguese trade was so important. English? Yeah, they yeah. would have needed forms of German because, of course, there was this tremendous trade coming up yes. down, down yeah. the Rhine <laughs> from the, the, and also from, from southern Germany, the mining areas in southern Germany. So you needed many languages and many ways of looking at the world and many ways of expressing the world. And again, I find that fascinating. It's so different from the ways in which we usually look at history which are confined behind national boundaries and even linguistic boundaries. It is fascinating, yes. Um, other questions from the floor? Who, is the, uh, who has, has a higher authority than the mayors of Antwerp? I'm thinking of the relationship to Brussels, for instance. Well, the relationship with Brussels kept going wrong because Antwerp would spend money and spend it and spend it, not always on the things they were supposed to spend it on. Um, there was at least one mayor who got a pleasure house and a rather large fortune out of the building of Antwerp's walls, which were never finished as a result. But the, there would be interventions from Brussels. There would be moments when all of a sudden officials arrived to say, you owe such an enormous amount of money that we are going to have to do something about this. Usually they wanted a new tax. Um, but it was much more like that. The day-to-day -day wasn't really done because one of the things that you have to remember is that the Habsburg court in the Spanish Netherlands usually relied on finding a handful of local people whom they thought they could trust. And they handed over as much as possible to them because they didn't have the day-to-day -day competence in administering in Netherlandish, for example. Um, so it isn't really quite like that. In theory, there is this enormous overpowering authority of the empire, but it has to bring in an army to make it real. And it does with Alba. And even when it brings in an army to make it real, and they build the citadel, the fort at the corner of Antwerp, they don't turn the first guns on the citadel on anybody who might be coming up the river to attack. No, no. The first bastions that are finished and the first guns are turned on the city itself. This is about an empire that was frightened of the city. And at a certain moment, was there a spirit of independence that also uh, reigned the Netherlands? Um, at any date, would Antwerp uh, throw off the joke of the Habsburg Empire? Well, the very strange things happen yeah. towards the Spanish takeover again, and the strangest of them all, it's, you're going to have to forgive me compressing this story into a tiny space, but uh, we, we, it may not make sense. But essentially there had been the great house of Mendes who were yes. Portuguese Jews who had set up in Antwerp partially in yeah. control of the Portuguese spice trade. The great Dona Gracia, the extraordinary woman who was head of the biggest merchant banking operation in Europe and who controlled it. What was that? Dona Gracia. Dona Gracia. Yeah. You, you can give her various names. It depends on whether you take her Spanish-Jewish name or you take her later names. It's usually easier to call her Dona Gracia because that was the conventional way to call it's her. It's an incentive to read the book, Dona Gracia. <laughs> but uh, sir, in the back. Um, undoubtedly. Actually, Plantin said that the reason he went to... He was writing a very strange letter to the Pope, which, needless to say, was mainly to prove that he was a good Catholic and really shouldn't be upset in any way. 
Um, but he was also saying that he came to Antwerp because it was a city of foreigners. Because he could find people who knew about all sorts of things. He could find people who could do all sorts of things that were useful to him. And I suspect, too, because it was more interesting. It was difficult to think of another city in 16th century Europe which is simply more interesting than Antwerp, where you would be constantly falling across things that you didn't know, couldn't know, couldn't guess at. I mean, it goes back to Paracelsus, the so-called alchemist, but in fact really doctor, um, comes to Antwerp and says that he learnt more shopping in the docks in Antwerp than he'd learnt in any school in his whole life. It was interesting. And Plantin did have all those letter types of all the languages, uh, the Hebrew and all the Oriental scripts. Yes, so, he, yes, he acquired them in all sorts of interesting different ways. Yes. I mean, he in, actually... Awkwardly for Venice, he inherited a lot of them from Venice, the Hebrew script. Yes, yeah, from yeah, yeah. Um, Baldo. Uh, yeah. 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 Yes, uh, there was another question uh, in the back, yes. You said you wanted to disclose a hidden city or a hidden Antwerp. Uh, <laughs> could you name, now that you painted the picture of that hidden Antwerp, could you name a characteristic that still uh, survives into nowadays Antwerp? That still yeah. determines the city as it is now? Well, you have to look hard. There's not a lot in the fabric, although I could, if, he would, if the owner would let me, which he probably wouldn't, take you through some interesting black iron gates. And when you're through them, you're in a courtyard with mulberry trees and roses. You're absolutely bang in the centre of Antwerp. And there is the most extraordinary house in the, the, the Flemish style, that wonderful combination of brickwork and stone, with a magnificent tower, because every gentleman required a tower. You had to watch your ships on the river, and the tower was a sign that you had lots of ships to watch, which was a very important measure of, of, of wealth. But there are rather few of those towers left. You can still see the shape of Antwerp in the layout of roads. I mean, in a way, the mayor, which was a market area, is still a market area. It's just it doesn't sell anything useful now, like cabbages. It only sells Louis Vuitton, which is not quite the same thing. Well, possibly. Who knows? Um, you can find some details. You have the cathedral, of course, although that has changed function enormously. It used to be the labour market of Antwerp. It's where you went to pick up a plumber and salvation at the same time in the morning. Um, the, stain, the stain is still there, of course, the fortress on the river. There are bits, there are bits, but the trouble is that it's overridden, in a way, by the 17th century, which is magnificent in its own right, but it's overwritten by the, the age of Rubens, the age of the Baroque, all those lovely Baroque churches, which in a way are misleading if what you're interested in is where all of this began. So there's not a lot left of 16th century Antwerp nowadays, but... Well, it's a town that's had a rough time. Yes. It not, yeah, only, had, the... it not only had 19th century town planning... Yeah. It was the first town in Europe where civilians were bombed in the First World War and the main target of V1 German rockets yes. in World War II. So, I mean, it's not surprising. There's not much fabric. Yeah. It's funny that you come up with the, with the idea of a tower since Antwerp is a city, as far as I know, that has a museum where the history of the city is being told in a tower, actually. Oh, well, yes, absolutely. Yes, 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 yes. Of course, they're in the Neustadt, so, I mean, who knows how authentic this will be. <laughs> um, I'm interested in the, in the kind of trades there were. And what, 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 was the, what were the main trades before the glory years and during the glory, glory years? I'm not going to answer directly, which is really annoying of me, and I apologise, but I have to say something else, which is that one of the reasons why Antwerp and Brabant, as opposed to Flanders, could be very successful in things, for example, like the wool trade with the English, was that they didn't have the, as, as much of the industrial production to protect. They didn't have the guilds to protect. And so they had a great deal more freedom. They could be a port that things went through. 
leaving a certain amount of profit behind, of course, but not actually. You didn't even have to unpack your goods on the docks at Antwerp. Now, because of that, the notion of what was produced in Antwerp for sale elsewhere is really a side issue because most of the stuff that was going was stuff going through. Does that make any sense? Yeah. I mean, there were, there were, of course... Is there a kind of development in, uh, in the kind of products which were uh, transported to Antwerp? Yes, but in the glory years, it doesn't change all that much. I mean, you've got spice coming through until the Portuguese sort of back out of the spice trade. You've got metals coming in from Germany and metal products, many of which were made around Antwerp and in Antwerp. You've got a certain amount of textile business, but not on the scale of other parts of the Spanish Netherlands. And as a matter of fact, you've also got wine. Oddly enough, Antwerp seems to Antwerp and Mechelen seem to have produced wine. It seems to have been the most disgusting wine that anybody has ever been required to drink, because it was a great unsuccess. <laughs> And one of the most, most important commodities you mention is uh, IDs and um, gossip, knowledge, that kind of thing. That's what you focus in the book. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yes. Yeah. It really is at every level. I mean, the gardens around Antwerp yes. were the basis for rewriting a lot of medical literature, a great deal. Um, what herbs you used, where they came from, because you have this extraordinary thing of... Plants are coming from everywhere. People know how to maintain them. They know how to grow them. And they also know what to do with them afterwards. Yeah. And one very important um, aspect is the map making also by Artelius. who was very yes. keen in map making of uh, the whole world. Yes, yes. Yeah. You can almost make Artelius a Charles Dickens story if you leave out about three quarters of the facts. Mm -hmm. I mean, here is a boy who is orphaned at the age of 12 and has to make a living for his family and his two poor sisters. Well, they've got rather a large property on Kipdorp, so I don't think we should cry too much, but he did have to do that, and he went into the map business. Yeah. He bought and sold maps, first of all, and coloured them. And he did something rather different from what you think of about colouring maps, which is making them pretty and making them good to hang on a wall. He coloured them for information. He wanted the colours to be part of the political information or the geographical information of the map itself. And later he became the great map maker. I mean, he is quite extraordinary. Vartelius, his name is derived from Vartel and Carrot. Yeah. yeah. Um, one more question, yes. Um, what do you know about the interaction between Antwerp and London, not just in terms of trade, because that was not the reason why Rademacher was there, but also in terms of politics and uh, religion, which brings us to the revolution? Of course. Mm, of course. It's huge. It's huge. I mean, first of all, Antwerp was of great strategic importance to London, because it was the easiest port to get to and then to launch yourself into continental Europe. Secondly, it was an area which was resisting the Spanish, which, as you know, the English did manfully all the way through the century <laughs> when we weren't giving in. Um, and we... In intellectual terms, it's more complicated, I think. Um, it's clear, for example, that somebody like Thomas More, early in the century, wanted the imprimatur of Antwerp and did not believe that he had that automatically as a scholar from England. It's true that you have a point where there's so much exchange going back and forth ever since the wool trade established itself between the two countries that you have this constant back and forth flow of information that goes with ships and with cargoes. You know, people travel with them, people have ideas, people find things out and carry them across. It's also true that because so much printing for England was done in Antwerp, the English were always looking for heresy in Antwerp. Bad printers. 
and Bibles in English and all the rest of those illegal things. And, of course, the English needed money from Antwerp again and again and again. Elizabeth I needed loans from Antwerp to keep going in order to buy, by the way, the other great trade of Antwerp that possibly I should have said more about, but it seems you only really have to say that it exists to understand. Um, the arms trade, which also went through Antwerp to an extraordinary extent, goes through the National Archives in London, and you'll find sort of one bill after another for the saltpetre, the gunpowder, the cannonballs, all the rest of it that are being bought in Antwerp and shipped across. So really the two, it's one economy in a way, one economy of ideas as well as one as, a, as an economy of money. Yes, one question from the bookseller, yes. <laughs> Oh, yes, but that, do that doesn't mean that Antwerp has fallen apart, for goodness sake. I mean, what do I think of Antwerp now? Well, I have six opinions. <laughs> it's the world, it seems to be the world capital of bad frocks, uh, which is interesting. <laughs> and it, it's said by The Economist to have more cocaine in its sewers than any other city in Europe, mm -hmm. which is curious. I don't understand that at all. Um, the food is wonderful. The town is really rather beautiful. And I'm extremely fond of it. It, it's glorious. I mean, I love the fact that you pick out the details on a street and you see a facade which, which is truly elegant and in between buildings of such horror you can hardly think about them. But th there are things that remain which are well worth seeing. We are drawing towards an end of the evening, but uh, there are still a few questions uh, left, uh, for example, um, in comparison with your book on New York. It, it must have been a totally different experience because there is an entirely different set of sources you use. Um, would you compare uh, New York as, uh, to Antwerp as the 20th century hub where it all happened? Well, I think I, I would compare it with 19th century Paris, 20th century New York, not necessarily because it's where everything happens, but it's where everybody outside those cities believed that absolutely anything could happen. Yes. I mean, it was where you... It was gossip, it was scandal, you know, it was murder, it was horror, it was all of those things, and also glamour. Yeah. And do you plan to write another book on a city or a biography of a city? No, I don't think so. No, no, no. no not, not unless I find one as interesting as New York or Antwerp. <laughs> Those are the two cities uh, of your choice. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, maybe another subject. Hmm? Maybe another subject for your next book. I'm not allowed to ask, but still. Yeah, well, yes, you're allowed to ask. It's so, it's, it's so megalomaniac that it won't give away anything. Uh, having written a book about the North Sea, I want to write a book about the South Atlantic. Oh, the South Atlantic. The yes. early South Atlantic. Hmm. Um, so roughly 1400 to roughly 1600, um, post-medieval, pre-colonial. Wonderful, yes. Um, it's doable, I'm not quite sure yet. But yeah, but also in your book on the North Sea, there's, uh, there are quite some pages devoted to Antwerp. Yes, absolutely. So we saw it coming, and uh, now exactly. you're going to the South Atlantic. Yeah. <laughs> I think I fancy the idea of the weather somehow in Brazil rather more than I fancy it here. Well, thank you very much uh, for your talk, for the questions, uh, for the answers to our questions. And I would really advise uh, everyone listening in the audience and uh, at home to read this book, but also the other books. Uh, it's really worthwhile. Um, and that's what the critics uh, also say. Uh, Antwerp, The Glory Years by Michael Pye. Thank you very much, and thank you, De Bezige Bij. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.